Well, thank you for being with us here today, whether you're here in person or online. Uh, it is a very special day. What a, what a month February is. It's great. Today's Valentine's Day, so that's important. We've already had the massive enjoyment of Groundhog's Day, and Friday was Abraham Lincoln's birthday, but tomorrow we celebrate President's Day, and we're eight days away from George Washington's birthday. How could February be any more exciting than that? So in the spirit of Valentine's Day, um, I have something I'm going to read to you that I saw. I, it's got to be true, <clears throat> and I apologize to the handful of people who had already heard this once with me, but it's too good not to use again. So Jacob, aged 92, and Rebecca, 89, were living in Florida, and they were excited about their decision to get married to each other. 92 and 89. So one day they're out for a stroll and they're discussing their wedding plans and on the way they pass a drugstore. And Jacob says, why don't we go in? So they go inside the drugstore and now comes a conversation between Jacob and a pharmacist. So Jacob says to the man behind the counter, are you the owner? And the pharmacist says, yes. Jacob, we're about to get married. Do you sell heart medication? Well, of course we do. Well, how about medicine for circulation? All kinds. Medicine for rheumatism? Definitely. Medicine for memory problems, arthritis, and Alzheimer's? Yes, a large variety. They all work well. What about vitamins and sleeping pills and Geritol? Everything for heartburn and indigestion? We sure do. Do you sell wheelchairs and walkers and canes? All speeds and all sizes and all types. And Jacob says, great. We'd like to use this store as our bridal registry. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I'm not advising that to any people in case you're making plans of sorts. So um, I'm not thinking of you at all. Last week, we talked about uh, the spiritual discipline of service. And I think the one tagline I had with that is, in service, be different. Uh, you know, be giving, be a servant, have that servant heart. And today we want to talk about stewardship. And stewardship, I, I probably would lean toward the idea of be responsible. So, in, in the area of stewardship, here's what the uh, Random House Webster's College Dictionary says. A steward is a person who manages another person's property or financial affairs, one who administers anything as an agent of another or of others. So if service is doing, then maybe stewardship is thinking or being. It's the uh, mental philosophy of life uh, and a proper worldview. That's how I'm looking at stewardship. This is incredibly important. You need to get to the point in your life where you realize that you have been called by God to be a steward. And you're probably saying, okay, Pastor Bud, but steward of what? What am I talking about? And the answer to that is really easy. It's everything, everything. You must come to the realization that God owns everything and you own nothing. You are just a steward. You're a manager. Uh, you're just entrusted with things by God, and it's your responsibility to do the best you can with it. So I'm going to read to you a statement now that I wrote, and uh, it's, I think it's really important. I want you to memorize this statement, so you're going to have to listen carefully, and I'm going to do it three times for you. By the way, you won't be able to memorize it, but here we go. You need to manage your time. By the way, th this um, idea of managing and stewardship involves our time, our talent, our treasures. And if I wanted to continue the alliteration, I would say even our thoughts, but I'll let that one go for now. So here's the statement. You need to manage your time as a gift from God to be used for him. After all, your times are his. They are in his hands. 
You do not own them. You live them out for him. You need to manage your talents as a gift from God to be used for him. After all, your talents are his. They are in his hands. You do not own them. You live them out for him. You need to manage your treasures as a gift from God to be used for him. After all, your treasures are his. They are in his hands. You do not own them. You live them out for him. So probably right about now you're thinking, okay, Pastor Bud, however, I do own my time and my talents and my treasures. Yeah, God's a part of that. But basically they are mine, right? Um, nope. No. Let me show you. We just read it. Elmer read it to us. Um, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So you break that down and you start looking at the different sections. You see that it says, the earth is the Lord's, the earth. Now the Hebrew word for earth there is basically talking about the land masses. So it's the land belongs to God. And when it comes down to the word, the world, that's talking about the habitable earth. So, you know, the, the places where people live. The Hebrew word for everything, this is amazing. It means everything. That's exactly what it means, everything. And then when it says, and all who live in it may include you. It may include you. You may be one of those who are all who live in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, all of this belongs to the Lord God. God owns everything because he made everything. That's what verse two goes on to say in Psalm 24. <clears throat> I can remember when I was a kid growing up in a, um, at Fairhill Presbyterian Church at the corner of Front and Tioga in Philly. And I don't have any idea how old I was. I'm guessing in the six, seven, eight year old range. And I remember at our church, we did a responsive reading of Psalm 24, okay? So that was just a couple years ago. And, um, and we did this responsive reading and Mr. Shaw was the one who read the part and we all followed. Mr. Shaw had a voice that would make the walls in this room shake. Uh, he just had a powerful voice. His grandson married my niece, by the way, which I thought was interesting, but that's a side issue. Um, but anyhow, I can remember when he got to the part about who can come into the house of the Lord, who can, uh, and then the answers that we gave were those who have clean hands and a pure heart. And I can remember thinking, I want to get into this place, you know, this, this room that reverberates that God is in. I want to be able to be there. And the only way to be there is to have clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands is talking about doing good deeds and good works. And a pure heart is really important because it's talking about proper motives. And the reason why I want to do all those things is because it's the presence of our God, our creator the God of glory, the Lord Almighty. That's how it's explained in Psalm 24. It's very, very important that that God is the one who made everything and owns everything, which includes you and I and everything that we know or touch. So I'm interested. There's a conversation that takes place in scripture that really has always fascinated me and uh, it's way too long to, uh, to do a full sermon on. So I thought, well, maybe I'll touch on it a little bit today. Um, the conversation is like this. There's a guy named Job, and he has gone through some horrible experiences, terrible things. And then to top it off, three of his good friends have come to comfort him, and all they basically are saying to him is like, Job, I know you're a good dude, but 
what did you do wrong? You got to have a black spot, a blind spot in your life somewhere that tells God that he needs to really beat you up badly because look at all this stuff. This doesn't happen to good people. This only happens to the worst of the worst. And Job is trying to defend himself and he's frustrated and he's trying to prove his case. And ultimately, he eventually, at least in his heart and mind, starts to complain to God and then God answers. And I think this is an interesting conversation because I think you and I can put ourselves in the place of Job in the future. There's gonna be a day when we stand before the Lord and I hope this is not how he addresses us when we stand there. But listen to some of these things. I'm just picking out stuff here and there from Job 38 and 39. It says, then the Lord answered Job out of a storm and he said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man because I will question you and you're gonna answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. Later he says, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? What is the right way to abode of, the abode of light and where does darkness reside? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you give the horse his strength or clothe his neck with the flowing mane? Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build his nest on high? Then God says to him, I, um, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Those are just a few of the 70 plus questions that God asked Job when he was putting him in his place. And those remind us of who God is. God is the one who made everything, who owns everything. I don't know the path of lightning. I don't know when the deer's gonna give birth. I, I don't know any of those things. I don't know how to distinguish the darkness from the light. Those are all God's domains. And we need to humble ourselves before God and recognize who he is. Here's what Job's very wise answer was. And I think it's going to be the answer you and I might give uh, in the presence of God on some occasion. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. <laughs> it's like, man, I am in the presence of a holy God. I need to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I just cannot continue to go on like this. I need to be silent because God is everything. And then God goes on in chapter 41 to say this, who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. That's the point we've been trying to make. Everything belongs to God. No one here has a claim on God. Everything is God's and we can claim nothing. God owes us nothing. We owe him everything. That is earth dwelling 101. <laughs> we need to grasp that. And until we really grasp that idea that God owns everything and I owe nothing, then we're just fooling ourselves if we think we understand this life at all. But once you do grasp it, man, what a wonderful release that is for us in this life. Everything is God's. It's all under his care. All I am is middle management. I'm just here to take care of what he has entrusted me with. I'll never forget when um, a long time ago, 
Abraham Lincoln posted this on the um, internet once. He said, and in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. And then I know that doesn't have a spiritual twist to it, but it could. And that is once we understand more fully this life and what God has for us, then we're better equipped to live it to his honor and to his glory, to live it humbly before him and to care for the things that God has us to care for. So the question becomes, how am I caring for my responsibilities? What kind of job am I doing? How well do I steward my time? It's okay to have downtime, but how about wasted time? Do we have much of that? How well do I steward my talents? Do I do it for God? Do I do it for others? Or am I really just self-promoting what I'm trying to do? How well do I steward my treasures? And those treasures include things, but also relationships. How well do I steward the relationship with my spouse or with my children or with my parents or friends or coworkers or brothers and sisters in Christ? How well am I doing at all those things? <clears throat> the Apostle Paul told us what's expected from us. In 1 Corinthians 4, it says, So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. People should see you and say, Wow, that is someone who is a steward of the things of Christ. And as those entrusted with the secret things of God. And now it is required that those who have been given a trust, and I think I put stewards in there in parenthesis, that they must prove faithful. We don't have to prove spectacular. We don't have to prove amazing. We don't have to prove great. We prove faithful to God. We are entrusted with these known areas of life, things that God has given to us. And there are some unknown things to us that God has given uh, and unknown to others, spiritual truths that we are entrusted with. How well do we steward those? How faithful are we with that? Peter said it this way when he wrote to uh, his readers. He said, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Whatever God has gifted you with, you're to serve others with it, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. We represent God's grace. And sometimes that's represented in other believers' lives. So we need to exercise that gift that God has granted for us to serve others. It's God's grace. And it's living itself out through us so that we can demonstrate to other people God's love and his mercy. There are some problems I don't know this individual that I'm going to give you the quote to next. Um, he has way too many initials in his name. I don't, I don't know who he is. Um, and he was writing, it's going to, you're going to think he's talking about Jesus and his disciples at that time. But I think he was really writing more toward today and we as disciples of Christ. When he said this, he said the disciples accordingly are called to be moral disinfectant in a world where moral standards are low, constantly changing, or non-existent. So I think you would agree with me that we're living in a day, I think it's 2021 right now, um, and we're living in a day in our culture where at best moral standards are low. I think you would agree with that. And they are constantly changing all the time, and they're either non-existent or close to non-existent today. That's where we're facing, and we are expected to be moral disinfectant. We're to be a purifying agent, a cleansing agent in our culture today. Not a conforming agent, but a cleansing agent. Chuck Swindoll addresses that too. 
when uh, he says this, I don't have it on the screen. That's fine. I didn't intend to. He said this, one of the greatest tragedies of Christianity's checkered history is our tendency to become like the world rather than completely different from it. Well, that's a pretty powerful statement, but the thing that really fascinated me was he actually wrote that nearly 40 years ago. And if you thought 40 years ago the Church of Christ looked bad, I think it's even a lot worse today in that area of conforming instead of being distinguished. You and I are responsible to be salt and to stay salty. And we're responsible to be light and to stay bright and shining in the darkness. Because someday we're going to stand before Christ and give an account for what uh, we have done in this life. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ, that's talking about what believers are going to experience someday when we stand before God and in his presence to give an account for how we have lived our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there are verses where Paul kind of expands on that just a little bit. And he says, starting in verse 12, he had already talked about how uh, they've laid the foundation for serving Christ and the church. And then in verse 12, he says, but if any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, and that's the day when we stand before the beam of seed of Christ, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. And if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So he's saying that everything that you and I do in this life is going to be accountable before God someday when we stand before Christ. And we're going to have to give a report to him on what we have done. And, and it's going to be there. The video evidence will be there. And we'll, we'll be judged on that. Some of that's going to be destroyed and say, Pastor Bud, that was worthless what you did. You wasted your time at that, that moment. Hopefully some of it will be judged as worthy of honoring Christ and serving him. In your bulletin, I listed five different crowns that are going to be given out at that time. Um, those are different rewards. I, I put that there so that you could look at it and study through those later on if you like. But the um, book of Revelation says this in chapter 4. It's the scene after, I believe, after the rapture has taken place. This is a scene in heaven that's going on. Uh, and Christ is on a throne and the um, living creatures, the cherubim, are all around him. And it says that the 24 elders are going to fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders are representatives. Some of them are the 12 representatives of the 12 tribes of Israel, and 12 of them are representatives of the 12 apostles of the Church of Christ. So you have, in the future, Israel, the redeemed of Israel, and the redeemed of the Church of Christ coming together and worshiping Jesus and bowing down before him. And it says, they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. There's going to be a day in the future where we are going to stand before God and we are going to worship him. This has representatives laying crowns down, but I mentioned to you that we could receive crowns, and I think we're going to cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus also. And so when we do that, 
we're going to say, yes, you gave me this crown for faithfulness or service or whatever I earned it for in you, but I'm giving it back to you because everything is about you. It's all about knowing you, worshiping you, and praising you. And we're going to do that someday in the future. And we're going to be able to give back to Christ those things that we've already done to honor and to bring glory to his name. So how are we doing with that? We need to start today. We need to start now at being faithful to Christ with what he has given to us because it's all his and it's to be used for his honor and for his glory. And our responsibility is just to be faithful and to do what has honored him the most. Would you join me in prayer, please? Lord, we do indeed want to be faithful servants of yours. Uh, we want to be good stewards of the things that you have given to us. And there's so much more we can say about that. But to just humbly lay ourselves before your feet and to give you worship, even as we will someday lay crowns before you, it's our job, our responsibility to be faithful with what you have given to us so that we can in return give you honor and glory. Lord, help us. It's so hard for us to do that. We are so distracted. But please work in our hearts and lives and give us the dedication, the commitment to stand firm with you on your word in prayer and all the disciplines that we've been looking at so that we can in return give back to you a good report and a good account of the things that you desire from us. God, I just pray that you would give us strength and courage, endurance, sometimes patience, as we go through very difficult times, but we go through those in order to bring honor to Christ. And we just pray that all that we do, all that we say, even things that we think, would be used to bring glory to Christ. In his name, amen.